Well, I can't wait for you to check out this conversation with Veronica Valley. She is the founder of Soberful, and she helps people to unlock all of the mystery around why we drink in the first place and really get to the root cause. Her program has five pillars to it. She's going to kind of run down what those pillars are all about. She's also going to go deep into her own personal story with addiction. Let's buckle up. Go for the ride with Veronica Valley. Here, we want to show you what's possible in the world of sobriety. We introduce you to the various tools, programs, and resources available, because there are way more options than you may even realize. We want you to find the one that works for you. And we do it through people, people who share their pathway to recovery and will help you find your path to freedom. Because getting sober can feel hard enough. You don't have to do it alone. I'm Sarah Roberts. And I'm Roger DeVoe, and this is Sobriety Starts Here. Veronica Valley, I am so excited to sit down and talk to you about your Soberful program. It is an awesome program where you help people to get sober. So I want to get started. Welcome. Hi, Sarah. Thank you. So yeah, I started the Soberful program because um, for some time people would ask me through my blog or on Facebook um, the how questions. So like, well, I've stopped drinking. So, but how do I deal with this situation? And well, how do I deal with the feelings, which is the big one, like they've stopped drinking and then they've got all these feelings that have come up that the drink has been kind of numbing and, and, and getting rid of. Um, how, how do they deal with uh, relationships? How do they deal with this trauma from the past? All these how questions. And I would answer people and, and I realized like, I have these answers. I've been doing this, this for a long time. I have all the training in it and I want to put that all together in a really simple program that that when people apply it they're going to see changes because we both know through the work we do that alcohol is not the problem it's a symptom of the problem mm -hmm. and we have to get to the engine of the problem so just stopping drinking you're still left with all of that stuff that alcohol took the edge off that kind of you know, you know, all the, you know, the feelings that were uncomfortable. And that's really what the Soberful program addresses. I really respect that approach because it's so true. Uh, you know, both of us find this in our work that people give up the drinking or their drug of choice. And then all of a sudden it's shopping or sex or sugar or food or whatever else. And it's to, to fill that hole. And until and unless we get down to those underlying reasons why we were using alcohol or drugs in the first place, we're still going to just be struggling. And that's what I love so much about the Soberful program is that you really help people find a life of freedom, which is something that's so important to me was um, in my work where it's just helping people to get free from all of this. So your program is amazing. There are five pillars. So can you share those five pillars with us? Sure. And I want to be really specific about how I describe freedom. When I describe freedom from alcohol, um, it, I specifically mean freedom in our minds. Mm -hmm. It's freedom in mm -hmm. our minds. That is the definition of freedom from anything that's obsessive or that's hijacked our lives like alcohol can. It's having our minds back. So we're not constantly thinking about alcohol, thinking about not drinking, mm -hmm. recovering from alcohol, from drinking alcohol, thinking about how to drink less, uh, the shame, the embarrassment from what we did when we were drinking, all that stuff rents a lot of space in our minds. Mm -hmm. and, and the solution, you know when you've got to the solution is when you have freedom from that. And imagine, imagine what you would be capable of if, you're, if your mind was full of other thoughts and, and, and more empowering stuff. So I really wanted to define freedom because that's my goal. Yeah. And I want to just make that, I, I love that you made that point. And I think it is so important for people who have just clicked onto this website and all of a sudden they, they, they see your picture and they think, okay, I'm going to learn more about this. It's so true. And we're talking about this idea that you can break free from those feelings of always thinking about alcohol, thinking about it, feeling that you can't live your life without it, that, um, that how are you going to be able to ever do your life without it? How can you go to a party? What is going to, what is your life going to look like? you can break free from all of those thoughts. It really can happen. And I think in those very early days, there's so much fear attached to losing 
that part of our lives, uh, you know, losing that drug of choice, losing that alcohol. We feel like that's so tied up with our identity. And I really respect what you're saying about the, um, the freedom being in the mind. It's so true. Yeah, I mean, not, not only does alcohol hijack our lives, it hijacks our minds. And that's the really, when you really sit and think about how much time do I spend thinking about drinking, thinking about not drinking and recovering from drinking, it's actually quite a lot and, and way, way more than, you know, that that's a minus. It, it, alcohol, once we've got to that point, alcohol is not giving us as much as what we're paying for it. And I don't mean money. So, so the Soberful program is, uh, it's very simply conceived and that there's five pillars, I call it, or five main areas that if you work on these areas and I have specific ways of doing that, you, your life will improve. And that's what I've seen in, in my clients uh, for many years. So it's broken down to movement, connection, balance, process, and growth. And I can talk you through each, each one if you want. That would be great. Yeah. So the first thing is, is movement, which is very simply, it's on, it's on two levels, very simply. The first one is exercise. And I'm not by any means an exercise guru. Like I, I am not going to be telling you how to exercise. I'm not a personal trainer, but what I do work with is, um, the blocks that people have for doing something that's actually going to benefit them. So it's like, I'm not telling you, Anybody who's watching this video, every single person will know exercise is good for you. Yet, we don't do things that are good for us. Not only is exercise good for us, obviously it's good for our physical health. It is essential for our mental and emotional well-being. It is essential. You will, I, I would say to people, if you, it's a brisk walk for 30 minutes, most days of the week, you do that in three weeks, I guarantee you, you will feel better. Mm -hmm. because you will get that regular endorphin kick. It just lifts you. But it's not just that. It also, um, by making that time in your life, it's an act of self-care. It's an act of self-love. It's saying that I'm, I'm worth this. And I get it. I'm a busy mom of two kids and my husband works a lot. I know how hard it is to carve out time for myself, but it's so important that we do that. So the first part of the program is simply you need to be having a regular, regular kind of exercise in your life, you know, and we look at, you know, and, and it's really interesting with that because it's, I work with people like, okay, right, I get that, right, I'm going to, I'm trying, I'm training for a triathlon, I'm going to do it in three weeks. I'm like, oh, whoa, okay, so that's a pattern of how you set yourself up to fail and kick that whole cycle off of, I failed, I'm not good enough, da, da, da. So I actually, what I work with is, is, the, the people who are like blocked for doing, you know, they're not doing something that, that's good for them or the people who kind of end up in the cycles of setting themselves up to fail. But it's also the movement part is about being very conscious about the direction of your life. So it's, I think often I, I felt like I was this kind of little boat on the ocean with no anchor. And I was just sort of at the mercy of the elements around me. And I was just sort of pushed this way and that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that we feel, I, I feel that we sometimes think, you know, it's like we lose control of our lives. We're, we're, we're kind of at the mercy of our feelings. We're at the mercy sometimes of other people's demands. We're, we're just at the mercy of our external world. And it's about stopping and being much more conscious about the direction, you know, of our day, of our week, of our lives. You know, is this the way I want to go? And it's not about waking up tomorrow and making dramatic changes. It's just about bringing this to your conscious awareness and beginning to make slight shifts in the direction that you want to go to. So that's the movement part. Um, so the next part is connection. So there's tons of really solid research that shows how essential connection is to human beings well-being. We, we were designed to be connected um, and interacting with each other. Um, and I feel that we're at the moment in this uh, age of extreme loneliness um, where we can be very separate. And I always say there's a, a alcohol that doesn't kill alcoholics. Um, pride, fear and loneliness kills alcoholics because those things keep us very, very separate. Mm. So the connection part of the program is, is really essential. So it's about certainly forming connections online, which can be a really, really good start. 
you know, and I, I've certainly, you know, you're one of my online friends. I think we've met in person once. I know we're going to meet in person again soon, yeah. but I know that this is an online friendship that's going to develop into a real life friendship. And, and I have many people already that, that that's happened with. So the online connections are a great start, but the key part is forming connections in your local community. So we look at that in, um, for people, we encourage people to look at local support for stopping drinking. Now there's various ways you can do that. And the sober call program works in, in a complement to all of them. So it could be AA meetings, smart recovery, refuge recovery, women in recovery, yoga and recovery. There's, there's tons. I mean, each neighborhood is different, but there'll be something there. Now, if there isn't, or if none of those things, they just don't appeal to you, that's also okay. We then would encourage uh, you and, and everybody else to look at how you could be connected in your community. So is it a volunteer role? Is it committing to a regular you know, exercise group? It, it, it's about being in a group where people can begin to know you, where you are committed to being there every week, that you allow you just allow people to get to know you. You allow those, those relationships that form and they don't happen overnight. You know, you have to show up, you have to show up regularly, mm -hmm. but the connection we, we just, you know, I, I feel that when I was drinking, when my drinking was at its worst, it was the loneliness that almost killed me. Mm -hmm. So that's a really essential part. Um, the next part, and these three, these three pillars are really the foundation. The next part is balance. So I have a saying that whatever the question balance is always the answer. So we, we start by kind of looking at um, the balance of your life. So a human being, if you imagine kind of, um, I call it the balance plate. So if you imagine a dinner plate that's divided up into different segments and we all have different needs. So we have our, our health, our spiritual life, our emotional life, our family, our social life, our career, all that kind of stuff. Whatever it is, we'll have similar but some different. And it's about looking at it, uh, where those things are out of balance, because when those things are out of balance, we will feel it. So once we can identify, ah, it's because this part of my life is really out of balance. I'm not getting those needs met. It's about then making the adjustments that we need to make. And here's the trick about balance is you may get that right today and it, it, that would be fabulous and that will probably last a while and then the circumstances of your life will change and you will have to redo it. So I, I went through that when I became a mom. Like when I was single, I had so much time to exercise and nurture my spiritual life and personal development. I was always going to workshops and reading self-help <laughs> books and listening to podcasts and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when I had kids, I had no, no time, no energy for that. And I definitely felt it. And I had to relook at these needs and meet them in different ways. So it's a lifelong process. So that's a skill that once you've learned it, I still use it, um, that you can use for the rest of your life. So it's like, you know, right now, stop and check your balance. What's off? Even today, like my, my, my son is not sleeping well, so I'm tired. So I'm not going to be able to get as much done today as what I could normally. And that's just, I'm going to just have to accept that. That's just yeah. how I can balance things today. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I'm loving it. And I just, I almost want to almost backtrack to that one point that you made where you said that pride, fear, and loneliness you know, these are the reasons why people fall back into old patterns. How, can you explain pride? I mean, I think we get loneliness, but what about pride and fear? Okay, so pride is, all pride is, is what we think other people think about us. So in a nutshell, pride is when we are full of fear about what we think other people are thinking about us. So, so pay attention to that. I don't actually know what you're thinking about me because I can't read your mind. So this is based on a guess, it's based on an assumption and more often than not, it's based on actually my own self view and self esteem. So I would be thinking, you're all thinking I'm not good enough. You're all thinking like, who does she think she is? All that kind of stuff. Now, you don't, you, nobody knows what anyone else is thinking, but that, that fear, that pride that, um, People, you know, I can't ask for help because people will think I'm weak. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell the truth about this situation mm -hmm. because, you know, people will think less of me. Ah, so this is so my story. That was all what my story was when I first got sober. I was so rifed with shame that I didn't share it for over a decade. I didn't share it. 
Yeah, and 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 that's it, it's it's that fear of what other th- people think, and it's pride. It's yeah. the I you know I have to maintain this certain view, th- this certain appearance mm-hmm. because what other people think of me is really important. It's this over value on what other people think about us. Yeah, and in my There's, own life, what other people thought of me was far more important than what I thought of me. Absolutely. So so this these are a couple of things that just changed my life. So f- first of all. What other people think about you is none of your business. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, I love so that line. Just, just like, just like what I think about other people is just none of their business because it's not about them. Everything we think comes through our own filters. Mm-hmm. And here's the here's the thing. Okay, so if anyone's listening to this, this will change your life. Nobody's thinking about you. <laughs> no one. They're not thinking about you at all because they're thinking about themselves. Mm-hmm. I know. They're, they're in their own heads, obsessing about their own selves with their own filters. <laughs> so all this time you've spent thinking, oh, they're thinking this about me. They think they're not. They, they haven't honestly given you another thought. <laughs> so I, I found that really liberating when I mm-hmm. kind of realized that. I was like, oh, right. How yes. egotistical of me to think that you were all obsessed with me. Yes. Yes, so true. So so true. God, we're such we're so ego driven. Yeah. So um yeah, so I think pride can keep us it it keeps us from being uh open, honest and connected with people because we we have to maintain this 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 veneer and this mm-hmm. appearance at all costs because mm-hmm. of the fear of what somebody else is going to think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um fear, I I I wrote about this in my book. Uh, for me, fear is the engine that drives alcoholism. And I feel that fear, peop, uh, alcoholics feel fear to a whole new level than ordinary people. And it, it's, it's, the, it's an intangible fear. It's fear of everything, anything, and nothing. And it's such a powerful and driving force that needing to numb and control that fear through outside substances and behaviors is paramount. So that's why when someone is presented with, okay, I can see that my drinking is a problem. I get that. I I get that alcohol doesn't serve me anymore, but you are asking me to give up the thing that takes away the fear. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I can withstand the fear that I'm going to feel without it. And I think understanding that is really vital for people's recovery. And I haven't met anyone with a drink problem who hasn't truly felt that in their bones, that you are asking me to give away the one thing that that takes away the fear. Even though I know it only takes away for a few hours, but the fear is here and it's absolutely intolerable. Mm -hmm. Our brains are designed to find something to take that away. And I don't think, and I don't think most of us, when we're actively drinking, can even label what we're feeling as fear. I think it takes, um, you know, doing some of the work on who we are and and what motivates us to to understand that underlying all of those reasons, anxiety, depression, you know, angst, um, all of that, it's it's all fear driven. You know, and not to say that not to say that there aren't medical issues going on with people with anxiety and depression. That's not what I mean. Yeah. But I think that really um, stripping away the layers and getting down to the the root that it is fear that's driving this addiction. I think that's really key. Yes, and um, we can have lots of fears, but in my experience, if you boil them down, there are actually two fundamental fears, and they are um, a fear of not being good enough. And that kind of comes to the pride thing again. I think that um, people with any kind of unhealthy behavior pattern, like binge eating, sugar addiction, alcohol addiction, et cetera, there's this kind of fear inside of them of, but I might not be good enough. And Mm -hmm. you're going to find that out. If you get close enough, you'll see that I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. And it, it happens to us usually quite young where we form that opinion and belief based on uh, experiences and how we interpret those experiences. And then what happens to somebody when they have that feeling in them for long enough, that fear that I might not be good enough, there is the next logical fear that follows that is, but if I'm not good enough, then I'm not going to be loved. And that fear is a basic, fundamental, existential fear that is the most painful thing to live with because Mm -hmm. 
we have to be connected. Mm -hmm. we, we have to, the fear of not being loved is, is mm -hmm. the worst thing that we can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. so, so if you, if you see me, if you know who I really am, if you actually get close to me, you aren't going to like what you see. So I'm going to keep pushing you away by using um, alcohol as my, as my buffer between me and, and another person. Yeah, so we often do this in our relationships. Like mm. I want, I want, but whoa, whoa, whoa don't, yes. don't, don't. You yes. know, we, it's the smoke and mir mirrors. It's the masks. It's the, it, it's just plain old fear. And, and um, they're based on these faulty limiting beliefs. And we really do address that in the program. We really, because here's the thing. It, it's what we call, it's either an irrational belief or a limiting belief. Once you really unpick those, because first of all, whoever's watching this, I want to say, first of all, those things are not true. If you believe that about yourself, they're not true. Um, and if you unpick them, you will begin to see that they, they have no substance to them. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we do that's very key in the process work that we do is begin to unpick our limiting and irrational beliefs that are, that are kind of, um, our behavior comes from our beliefs. We, we, we behave the way we feel. All behavior is a manifestation of how we feel. We feel, and then we behave in ways to deal with or respond to those feelings. Mm -hmm. So once you unpick and change those limiting beliefs and those, I had, those were in me. Like I believed those things. Like I believe the sun is going to set tonight. Those, those were just rules. Those were, and when I finally did the work to unpick them and got rid of them, now that for me is laughable. Yeah. Now, I know not everybody likes me. Yeah. That's okay. Um, I like me. I have lots of people in my life who like me and have lots of people who love me. And it, it, it's like kind of this right sized, you know, I just, mm -hmm. I, those things are laughable to me now, but they governed my life, governed my life for yeah. a long time that you were unlovable and that you were not good enough. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we can, I think most people watching this, I think most people that I've ever spoken to with an addiction issue feel that way or yeah. have felt that way or know that when they kind of look back on the trajectory of their life, that that's when things started. I can't believe the number of people that I'm, you know, contacting with this project and so many have the same story. I felt other. I felt outside. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt weird. I felt unlovable and like, you know, that nobody would like me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so that kind of leads into the next part of the program, which is process work. So process is everything. We are always in a process. So we're always in a healthy cycle of processes or an unhealthy cycle of processes. And all process is, is something happens we feel a certain way about what has happened. We then choose to respond a certain way to the feelings that we had about the event that happened. That's a process. So for me, something happened that was uncomfortable or difficult or frightening. I would then choose to drink or pop a pill or binge eat to deal with the feelings that I got from that event. Then I would later on feel shame and guilt and all the, you know, not good enough, all that kind of stuff. Um, then I would feel, I'd be miserable for a bit. And then I would sort of do some kind of crazy rationalization to try and make it okay. And then something would happen and then the cycle would, would just keep going. So I was always in that process. Mm -hmm. So process, it's about, again, it's about the consciousness. It's about when we begin to understand why we feel the way we do, why we behave the way we do, and understand that a lot of the things that we thought were real and were true are actually not. Mm -hmm. And we begin to unpick them and replace them with different beliefs and different attitudes. Mm -hmm. Our processes change. Yeah, because I imagine that people in your program, they, they look at these, you know, what they believe are truths in their life, and they really can make a change to look at them and say, but that doesn't have to be the truth. I can question it. I think it's bringing it out into the light instead of we, we are usually working on autopilot. We just usually, you know, this thing happens. We feel this way about it. We do this thing in response, but it's just taking that step back and looking at how we behave, how we process that. It, those are when the, when the big fundamental change can happen. It's amazing. Yeah. So pro process, so movement, balance, connection are the foundations. Let's get those foundation stones in place because you will begin to feel better. 
And then when you've got those foundations in place, you then have the support to do the process work, mm -hmm. to begin to do the work that really unpicks what created the problem in the first place. And because once you change how you feel, once that's changed, your whole life changes. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. It really is. It's like, um, it's so true. Just as soon as you can be raise the awareness about what's going on, where you, instead of being so enmeshed in it, it's taking that step out and looking at your life and looking at your behaviors. And then all of a sudden it's, this isn't serving me. I don't have to make that choice. I can make different choices. So I really love, um, I, I just love your Soberful program. So keep going. What's number five? And then the fifth one is growth. And um, there is a universal law of life that we are all growing or dying. And if you look around, you will see that to be true. You can see that in nature, in animals, you can see that in people, you can see that in organizations, in businesses, we have to grow. But what happens when we are drinking destructively or eating destructively or whatever it is we're doing, we can't grow. And it's our spirits. I'm talking about our, you know, our spirit, our, who we really are. Just, we're, what we're doing is surviving. We're existing day to day. We're just cope. We're just getting through. Mm -hmm. We're not. We're not growing. We're just in the same cycle of responding and doing the same thing. So, so to really like to get the good stuff, and you'll hear people, you know, in recovery like ourselves talk about like the good stuff, how great it is. To get to that, you have to grow. And you know, with growth comes a bit of fear because we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zones things might change, you know, we might, there might be opportunities that we never dreamed of taking that we really want to take. And there's a whole process with that. We kind of explore all of that, you know, it's like, you know, we just have to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where, you know, for me, it's about, that's where we become the best version of ourselves. That's mm -hmm. really what it is, becoming an aligned with who we really are. When, when anyone asks me, um, what my job is and what my job really is, is to return people to themselves. Mm -hmm. That's all I do is I have some tools that will return you to yourself because we are not ourselves when we are destructively drinking and abusing ourselves and our families and our environment in that way. That's not who we really are. It really isn't who we really are. We are totally shrinking into being somebody that is not who we were meant to be. And I think that uh, for me, I remember many times where I'd be hungover and just feeling awful and being in my apartment by myself. And I'd have those moments where I'd say even out loud, you know, what are you doing? This is not what you're supposed to be doing. You know, you're better than this. This is not the way to live your life. But I was so afraid of losing my friends and my lifestyle and afraid of what I might have to face if I didn't keep doing the thing that I was doing, which was drinking. Um, I, just fear definitely kept me stuck. So I'm, I'm really loving what you're talking about. It really feels like a real opportunity for people to grow into who they really were meant to be, who they really are. And it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter how bad you think you are. You're, it, it, it doesn't matter where you've been or the mistakes you've made. No matter what, you can always, always become who you were meant to be. There's, it's never, ever, ever too late. If there's anything that I've learned yes. um, in my own life and in, the, and in these beautiful conversations I get to have is that it is never, ever too late. It, we can always grow. It doesn't matter if you're 90 and you're watching this and you're thinking, maybe I should put the alcohol down. You know, it's, it's not serving me. My, my maternal grandmother quit drinking in her, I think she was in her 60s and, um, and didn't drink again until, until she passed. And she didn't label, label herself in any way. She just decided that it wasn't serving her anymore. And she wasn't being able to grow into the woman that she wanted to be. So it is never too late, ever, ever, ever. So how do people learn more about the Soberful program? How can they connect with you and, and how do they go forward with it? Um, so they can connect through uh, Facebook. I have a closed Facebook group where I uh, teach the, uh, um, about the Soberful program. So if you uh, go onto Facebook and look for the uh, Facebook group Soberful, or they can find it through my website, which is veronicavalley.com um, or soberful.com. Um, and, uh, it runs every few months and we, we, uh, we really just have a fantastic time. Uh, it's really incredible seeing just really profound changes. You know, this is a lot of this stuff is what I used to teach when I used to work with people one-to-one -one 
or in treatment in, and, and in clinics. And so many people just, that's just not an option for them. They can't afford it or, you know, just, time, you know, just people can't go for four weeks to a treatment center or anything like that. So no. a lot of this, these tools is stuff that I've been using and, and, you know, worked with people for a long time. So what's the experience if people want to take the Soberful program? So you said that it, it only runs, um, it's not ongoing constantly. So what is the experience? They, they, start, they reach out to you and then do they get a workbook to begin with? How does it work? So my Facebook group, it's free and there's a free workbook that you can download when you join the group. And I have like a bunch of videos and a bunch of teachings and, and I regularly take questions and comments and all that kind of stuff in my group. And that's just free for anybody who wants that kind of help. And then if people want to go like deeper and really, really deep into this, then there's a paid program that uh, runs uh, about every three months or so. And, and the information about that would be in the group. So there's a, the, the ton, I have tons of free information for anybody who's really looking to, you know, wants that support, wants to be in the group. And then if you want to go deeper, there's also a paid program. And I really like what you said earlier that if somebody um, is connecting with you and they're, they're wanting to go further, they can go into the Facebook group, they can get some of those tools, but then also that you're not affiliated with any other um, organization, but that that personal connection is really key. So, you know, if you wanted to try an AA meeting and remember, and I keep saying this in so many different videos, if you don't like the first one you go to, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try another one. There are so many out there. And I didn't use AA for my recovery model, but I know for so many that it's it's a wonderful way to connect with in real life sober people. Um, there's NA if that's um, if that's where you know you you're you're more leaning. Um, and then like like Veronica was saying, refuge recovery, smart recovery. Or I was even going to say even for that loneliness piece, if people really aren't connecting with any of that. Um, what do you think about meetups, people going to meet up just, you know, a knitting group or a tennis group or something that isn't related to alcohol, but just something that they might be able to meet other people doing sober activities? Yes, that's exactly what we encourage is, is not just the support groups, but just groups in real life. And I think that that's the, the key is consistency. It's not just kind of, okay, I went and I said hi to a couple of people. It's actually mm -hmm. go get a commitment, like help, mm -hmm. show up every week, get to know people, allow people to get to know you. That's, mm -hmm. that's the real key to it. And what you, what I find is a lot of people when they join my program will say, I used to really enjoy whatever it was. And I don't do that anymore. And I say, go and do that. <laughs> Find that group of people. Like one lady used to love crochet, crocheting and she used to go and do that in a group, like on a Wednesday night. And she said, it was brilliant. We had such, you know, women would tell stories and, mm -hmm. and she felt really supported and loved. And I'm like, go back and do that. You know, mm -hmm. what, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So you'll often find most people have stuff that they used to do that the alcohol has taken from them yeah. and going back and finding that part of themselves is really key. Oh, I think it's so key. It's so brilliant because it does just once again re reaffirm who we really are. It helps us connect to the pieces of ourselves that are true. Um, and I really love what you talked about exercise at the beginning. You know how important that is in my life because I just truly agree with you that when we get moving, we feel so much better. They always, you know, there's that saying that, um, you know, exercise is the most underutilized antidepressant and food is the most overutilized anxiety drug. And, and, yeah. and that's the way I see it in the world. We are stuffing our Ourselves with alcohol and with food and with crap that is making us feel worse and worse and worse and and then and exercise we're avoiding because we feel so shitty so we don't want to go and do the thing that's going to make us feel so much better but movement I love that that is a main tenet of your program um, you, you don't see that very often in in these types of programs and I really respect that that's something that you believe is a pillar that is not just something that you're adding in no, uh, to supplement it it's a main tenet of your work and, and it's brilliant. And I, and I really value that so much because I find that so helpful in my own life and everybody that I um, have ever worked with that incorporates exercise, they say, you know, oh, I'm just feeling so much better. And I also really feel that um, we were talking about exercise and that feeling of pride, not only feeling good, the endorphins are rushing and we're feeling good for having a commitment and we're doing it every day and we're, we're staying true to ourselves, but that feeling of pride that we have when we can check that off on the calendar and say, I did it today. I did that. And that just feeds into more self-love and self-respect and self-acceptance. And, uh, and it just, I think, continues to compound over time. I think it's, it's a really valuable tool. I'm so glad that it's so important to you and your work. I, I think the research is 
overwhelming. Like it's amazing. how, you know, exercise, and, and there's, there's research that shows, you know, you get a group of people who've, who've got some kind of depression diagnosis and put them in an exercise program in six weeks, the majority of their symptoms are gone. I think that personally, we could solve most of our mental health problems if everybody exercised, got enough sleep, and were connected to each other. Like, I think we would only be left with like 2%. Uh, I would and love... I those, those things are... So, those are so, and I think we've forgotten that. Like, we, we, we want all these fancy, really expensive solutions, and we want pills, and, and it's not. It's like back to basics. It's just so essential. And, you know, I... Like sometimes when I can't get to the gym or I'm just too busy, I do like 30 minute YouTube videos at home and I have two little boys. So I get interrupted a lot. And sometimes it takes me like 50 minutes to complete them. And I tell them, I say, this is mommy's taking care of herself. This is mommy's time. I put the TV on for them. I don't like sticking my kids in front of a screen, but I have balance in my life. We do that for 30 minutes and then mommy feels great. We get ready and then we do something fun. So, you know, I'm, I want to show them that this is how I take care of myself. I'm not always available to them and their needs. And, and they learn that. And it's really, it's just so important. Yeah, we, I couldn't be a bigger fan. And I know, like, I went to spin class this morning and got my ass kicked, you know? <laughs> like, I'm not, you'll never see me in a triathlon. You know, I'm like, I, my husband did a 5K on New Year's Day. And I was like, it's too cold. You know, I'm just there on the bike. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's not about being the best athlete. It's just about doing something. Oh, I could not agree more. You know, you're so speaking my language. And I just, I couldn't help but remember back to when we're children um, and our mothers are taking care of us. So you were talking about taking care of your children. What do our mothers do? They make sure that we get our naps. They make sure that we go to bed on time. They make sure that we're properly nourished. They make sure that when we go to kindergarten, we're making friends. Like that's what's important. That's what's, but that's what's graded in kindergarten. And how yeah. well do they play with others? Are they outside at recess, you know, on the playground? Are they having fun? Are they interacting? They're moving. I mean, these are just all things that we learned as children. And over time, we unlearn them for whatever reason. But uh, to bring those, those major tenets back into our lives and to, to see the value in them, that is huge. And, and it does seem like it's just going right back to basics. But it is. It really can be as simple as we want to make it. We can make it more complicated than it has to be getting sober and living a really good life where we're not constantly thinking about having a drink and we're not, we're not feeling um, like it's sacrifice or deprivation that we don't get to drink. We truly can and we do get to a point where we love our lives so much that we don't want to drink to escape them and that is the whole goal. And, uh, and clearly people that take your program, I mean, the testimonials are unbelievable. I love it. I love your work. I love everything about you. And I can't wait for more people to take your program because it's amazing. And even like Veronica was saying, people just go to her website, check out the free tools, see how you connect with it, do a little bit of the work. And then when the next, um, the next Soberful program is coming out, then you can jump on board and get really enmeshed in it. But I love it. I think it's amazing. And I think you're amazing and you know oh, that. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> so yeah, if you're ever wondering what I think of you, <laughs> you don't have to think too hard. I would love it if you would share with people your experience and your story because I, we know where you are today and all of the work that you've done on yourself to bring you to be in this wonderful, beautiful, healthy, whole place. But that was certainly not always the case. And you touched on it a little bit, but would you mind walking us back in time a little bit? Sure. So, um, I felt from a very young age, like five or six, uh, I think, uh, that there was something really wrong with me. I, I felt that I just never felt comfortable in my own skin. I think that's the only way I could describe it. You know, I was always concerned about whether people liked me. I, I def definitely didn't feel good enough compared to other people. And uh, growing up in the UK, when I got to about 15, I was able to go into bars because I could wear makeup and high heels and get served. And I'll never forget my first drink because for me, it was like the light bulb went on and I, it was like magic. I, I fitted in my own skin. I felt attractive. I felt confident. I felt powerful. And I was a classic binge drinker. And I, I'm highly allergic to alcohol. So when I drank, I would always be deathly sick for several days afterwards. It's insane. You know, 
throwing up black bile. I mean, really, you know, uh, I, there was one incident when I was 15. I remember I was in a pub and um, it was like midnight and it was a lock-in. This was back in England when uh, pubs used to close at 11 p.m. and some pubs would close the curtains and you could drink in secret kind of thing. Oh, wow. And I remember sitting at the table and feeling like I'm going to throw up. And then I woke up in the gutter outside in the early hours of the morning, covered in my own vomit with the landlord throwing a bottle of a uh, uh, bucket of water over me. And I kind of had this vague feeling that this, this, this is probably not a good thing. <laughs> and like, I, I remember the next day, this is way before social media or cell phones, but I remember meeting oh my friends and somehow my brain had done this complicated gymnastics to present that I'd had a really great night. Wow. So I mm -hmm. rebranded that whole thing mm -hmm. to that was a great night out and put it in my filing cabinet in my brain for further reference. This is what a great night out looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, that was kind of typical of my drinking. I was a binge drinker and I had a really great time. I really enjoyed alcohol. Uh, I, I used drugs as well. And um, I, uh, I was a, I think I was almost 18. I was still 17 when I did uh, LSD and had a bad trip and went into drug induced psychosis. And I couldn't tell anybody because I was too scared. I was too, it was pride. I was too scared to put into words what was happening to me in case if I put it into words, then it would be real. And if I didn't put it into words, then it wasn't real. So I, I, then went from, you know, th the thing about drinking is that we never talk about is there's a cost and there's a benefit. And when I was 15, 16, the benefit was, it was fun and wild and crazy. And there was always a cost for me, but I was, that price I was willing to pay, it was fine. But th those kind of scales tipped very quickly for me and the benefit, the, the cost just far outweighed the benefits, but I never saw that. So when I went into drug-induced psychosis is when that started my prescription drug problem because I got would always get prescribed because I had uh, daily panic attacks, anxiety, severe anxiety. I couldn't be on a bus. I couldn't be in a room. I couldn't be in groups. All of that stuff was very hard for me and because of my anxiety and panic attacks. And I that's when I began my drinking switched to drinking to cope. And I remember being in at university and um, I couldn't sit in lectures because I'd have a panic attack. But I wanted to finish my degree. So um, in England, it was pretty easy to go to the bar at lunchtime. So if I had an afternoon lecture, like a pint and a half of lager, of beer, would be enough. Like I'd be fine to get through the lecture. But when the lecture was at nine in the morning, I, I had a problem. And I remember being in the toilets at, at college with a bottle of vodka in my water bottle like drinking it like ugh, to just to be able to get through the lecture and did I your, can I can I ask so, you did your did your panic attacks and anxiety start before your drinking and then drug the LSD use or no after no. I mean I I definitely think the roots of that were there because I was an insecure person and I think that insecurity neediness uh, that just not feeling good enough is the seed that that will grow from. Mm. But no, I, I wasn't, uh, it was the uh, drug abuse that triggered like the psychosis that triggered massive panic attacks. I didn't have that before, mm. but I think the, the soil was fertile for it. Mm -hmm. So you're in college and you're drinking the, the vodka bottle. And um, I remember, and it was disgusting. And I remember thinking, this is what alcoholics do, like drink secretly at 9am. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I, but I don't think I'm an alcoholic. I can't be because I think alcoholics enjoy it. And I'm not enjoying it. I'm doing it because I have to. Oh, interesting. <laughs> see the, see the crazy yeah, the gymnastics. <laughs> yeah. The mental gym we do to rationalize that what we're doing is okay. And I, so I did like 10, like 17, I went into this psychosis and the panic attacks and I got sober at 27. So I had 10 years of <laughs> just, just keeping my head above water, just coping while trying to present to the world that everything was okay. 
and I, I think I would look like your typical 20 something party girl. Like I always had jobs, like I had quite an outgoing, confident personality, yeah. but this incredible low self-esteem and fear. So I was always like, you know, I was always in jobs where there was, I always found jobs where there was always a group of people who went to the bar and, you know, I was mm-hmm. right in the thick of that. And just, you know, my connections with people were just dissatisfying, inauthentic, toxic. All of my relationships were hard. My romantic relationships were a disaster. I was so insecure. I would go out with anybody who looked at me once. Um, I almost married someone who I didn't love because he was nice to me and, and I was exhausted. And it was just, you know, 10 years of just not living, just surviving, desperate, suicide attempts, just feeling, you know, and uh, running away. Like I moved a lot, moved countries a lot, just running, 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 always thinking, always looking for an external solution, always thinking when I got that job or I moved to that place or I got that boyfriend or I lost 10 pounds, mm-hmm. whatever it was, when I got that, I'd be fixed. Then you'd be happy. Then you'd be fine. Yeah. Did, I wanted to ask, did your, did your parents, did your family know what you were going through? Or did you hide it from them as well? No, I left home when I was 16. A uh, lot, very difficult home life. And I left home at 16 for many reasons. Um, but one of them was to be free to do what I wanted I think, I think my parent, my mom, my dad died when I was 18 and my mom didn't really have a, I, she, I mean, she just didn't have a grip on that. I mean, I don't really think that they knew until afterwards when I told them in more detail, mm-hmm. they maybe saw me as a bit flighty and unmanageable and unreliable, but I, I mean, I consider myself an alcoholic. I mean, I have, you know, you can describe it how you want. I have an alcohol use disorder. I'm an alcohol, you know, whatever, but like, um, I, at the time, I don't think like nobody would have, you know, I thought someone, an alcoholic was a smelly old man on a bench drinking out of a brown paper bag. Yeah. I thought I had, I did know something was wrong with me. I knew something was wrong with me. And I thought I had a rare mental health condition. So I, I was looking for help. I would, I went to a lot of doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, counselors, churches, self-help gurus. I, I searched, I was really looking because I knew something was wrong with me, but I never considered that my alcohol drinking was a problem because I was a binge drinker. I didn't drink every day. You know, the instant, like I did drink in the morning on a very few occasions, mostly I was a binge drinker. Wow. And so, okay, keep going with your story. So now you're 20, so you quit drinking at 26. So how did you get to the point where you, so when you were seeing all of these self-help people, all of, you know, church, you were talking, were you not sharing with them your alcohol use? Cause you really didn't think it was part of the problem. You were just telling them that you had all of these other issues going on. You know, I, I, yes, I, I, a, I don't think they actually asked that much and B, I think I probably lied hmm. because I didn't really see the, I didn't really think it was re- relevant. I just mm-hmm. didn't think like may like I'd still did drugs from time to time. And I could accept that doing cocaine was probably not a good thing. Mm-hmm. But um, I didn't, I, I was so, you know, I believed alcohol was a good thing in my life. And I didn't really see how that was related to any other problem. Even though you were, were you still getting sick for days after yeah. drinking? And you oh, and still didn't hangovers. say it, sorry, I, I cut you off. Go ahead. So the worst hangovers, just the worst. That's why I was a binge drinker. I would like Sunday, I would be in bed all day. Monday, I would go to work or college or whatever it was, like drag myself there, like barely do anything. Tuesday, I'd feel a bit better. Wednesday, I'd pretty much be back to myself. Thursday, I'd feel fantastic. And Thursdays are when the weekend started. So I'd go out Thursday night. Friday, I'd feel crap. But if you have a drink at lunchtime, then I'd feel great again. And that would be, that, that was kind of my cycle. That was my pattern. So what happened in your life that you finally put the puzzle pieces together and realized that alcohol was at the pinnacle of all of these issues? Well, I met someone. I met somebody who, uh, who said they were an alcoholic and they told me a bit about their story. And, and that was the first time I kind of thought, oh, ooh. And I also was starting to do training to be a therapist, which sounds crazy because I was still, <laughs> I was crazy. Um, and the reason in my, my crazy head, I was thinking... Um, 
it was because of my panic attacks. I couldn't work in groups, but I thought I can work on a one-to-one and I can help people. Mm. <laughs> so I would sit in class and be going, oh. <laughs> and it, it was, you know, I never had that, like woke up and thought, oh my God, I have to stop drinking. It was a very slow realization when this information was coming in. I was, it felt very foggy. I felt very foggy. Mm-hmm. And I think, and one day I decided that I wasn't going to drink that day. And that turned into a week and it turned into a month. And I felt a lot better because I just felt so much better. And I wasn't really like, um, and then all of a sudden I didn't have any friends because all my friends were fair weather drinking friends. And then I started going to some self-help groups and different ones. And then I heard someone talk about fear. And when I heard someone talk about fear for the first time, and they spoke about how frightened they were of everything, anything, and nothing. That's when, that's when I had my light bulb moment. That's mm-hmm. when I had that moment where I was like, oh my God. Yeah. I thought I was the only person on the planet mm-hmm. who felt that way, who felt that frightened and lonely and insecure and full of fear. And, and oh, that's why I drink is because I feel like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's a solution. I, there's stuff I can do about that. Mm-hmm. It, it's like, it, it was like dominoes. They all fell into place. And that was at that moment, that was like, I was like, what to show me what to do. I'll do it. I'll do, I'll do whatever you say. Mm-hmm. I just need to stop feeling like this. Mm. So I did lots of things. The 12 steps were one of them. I did a lot of therapy. I did a lot, a lot of work on myself. I like, I was highly motivated and, um, my life got better. And I, I continued my training as a therapist and I was working in a clinic and my, you know, I just, my life got so much better. Um, you know, I did a lot of work on myself. And then I, I remember there's two big instances, Sarah. One was when I was about 18 months sober and one of the, I was working in a treatment center and I was about two years sober, maybe something like that. And, um, one of the clients committed suicide and I remember being in a store feeling just awful and getting a bunch of chocolate and like all my binge food. And I remember standing at the checkout in England on Sundays, the the stores close at like 4 PM. And I remember this feeling of desperation of what I'm, how am I going to feel when this runs out? And I thought, I have a problem with sugar and food. Mm -hmm. And so I had this other realization. So I began, it's like peeling layers of an onion. Mm -hmm. So I did that work. And then I was about three years sober and I had my first romantic relationship in recovery because I was just incapable of them. Mm -hmm. I was so dysfunctional in my relationship, so full of fear and insecurity, Mm -hmm. um, very insecure attachment. And I had a relationship in recovery and it didn't work out and it finished me off. I was in a black hole of despair Mm -hmm. and I was suicidal. Mm -hmm. And I realized I didn't want to drink. I didn't like, I didn't want to drink. I just didn't, there was nothing. I didn't, And I was, I realized I was making a decision to not kill myself because romantic relationships trigger our attachment needs. And I had, I was very insecurely attached. I I recreated abandonment over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And it just, the older I got, the more painful that was. Why do you think you didn't want to drink? Because that would be such a typical situation where so many of us have stressful times after we get sober and right away, sometimes our, our first thought is to, is to drink. Why do you think that was different for you? I think partly because at that point I had done a substantial amount of work on myself and I ha- that was an insurance policy. If the pain had continued, I would have done eventually. But in those first few weeks I didn't because I knew that it wasn't going to solve anything. Mm-hmm. I, and I didn't, I, I didn't want to numb that. I wanted that pain to go away. I wanted the pain. I just didn't want to ever to feel that pain again. Mm. So I, I knew that what I would probably do is go to the doctors and get, go, go down the prescription drug route at first. And I'm not, you know, prescription drugs are appropriate for lots of people. But I knew for me, I would um, then start abusing them. And eventually that would lead me to drinking. If I didn't, I, I was very clear. I knew that I had a really big issue and I needed to deal with it. And if I didn't, I knew that I would end up in a very bad place. And you knew you had a very big issue with? 
what? with um, uh, romantic relationships and attachment and a cycle that I would create over and over again, mm -hmm. where my relationships were incredibly unhealthy and toxic. And mm -hmm. I would create this whole pattern where I would be rejected and abandoned again and again and again. So how did you work through that and get to the other side of that? What was the work that you did? So it, it's basically process work. Yeah. I went deep, deep, deep into my family of origin, into how I felt about how I feel about myself. I went deep into inventory work and inventory work is where you continue to reveal yourself to yourself. And what you reveal is that you are the architect of your own misery. Mm. So I was very much stuck into this keeps happening to me. Why does it keep happening to me? Yeah. And what was revealed to me is I set the dominoes off. Mm -hmm. I put the first one down and they went bang, 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 mm -hmm. bang. Uh, I always connect with when you say the architect of your own misery. It's so true. When I, I talk a lot about the law of attraction in my work and just knowing that the law of attraction is happening around us, whether we want to believe it or not. And I, I make it so simple when I say to people, if you've ever planned a vacation, that's the law of attraction at work. You had a dream that you want to go to Hawaii, then you figure out how to get the plane tickets and you get yourself to the airport and you all of a sudden you're having a... a you know, a nice time on the beach. And, you know, that's kind of how it goes. And so this architect of your own misery, it can go, you can either create it, create your life and set it up so that you're having really negative experiences over and over and over again, or you can create your life where you're creating really positive experiences. And yes, we have shitty times and things go wrong but for the, you know we really do have so much control about what's going on if we can get very centered and know what's happening inside of us and and how we contribute to those outcomes yeah and and, and when when that was revealed i a shift occurred and i began to feel differently and i began to see that just things began to fall into place and I began to feel differently about myself, which was the biggest thing was I began to feel differently about myself. And subsequently from there, everything began to change. You know, I was the kind of person that I would walk into the office on a Monday morning and I'd be like, Hey Sarah, how was your weekend? And if you were at your computer going, yeah, it was fine. I would think, Oh, what did I do? Did I, like, did I say something? Like, why doesn't Sarah like me? And I would spend all day wondering like what I did to upset you and trying to figure that out and trying to get you to like me again. Blah, blah, blah. Like that's absurd. Now I would walk into the office and be like, Hey Sarah, how was your weekend? And if you weren't, yeah, it was fine. I would think, I wonder what's up with Sarah. And I would go about my day. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like a little thing, uh, but it that is that it's is a massive, huge thing. Massive. That is a mass. I think that's bigger than, I think that is so huge for so many of us. I think it, it ties in exactly with our fear of not wanting to be seen. I think it's that it ties in with our fear of not being good enough, of not being liked enough, of not being worthy, of not being lovable, all of those things. I think that it's not a little thing, even though it seems like such a little thing. It's all about what do people think of me? Yeah, it's really about becoming free of the good or bad opinion of others, because yeah. how I felt about myself was the most important thing. And mm -hmm. I was able to take daily, regular action to ensure that I liked myself mm -hmm. and that I felt comfortable in my own skin. Mm -hmm. And he here's the thing that I do teach is that we are responsible for the experience we want to have. And one of the traps that we can fall into is to get stuck in our story and some of us have very powerful stories of look what happened to me yeah and look how this is because this happened to me mm -hmm. and and many of us have had very tragic things happen to us mm -hmm. and they, they need um healing and they need validating and and they can't be dismissed mm -mm. however at a certain point all of us will get to a point where we realize we actually had a choice in how we responded to what happened to us. Mm -hmm. and, and that was revealed to me very clearly that I am responsible for my experience here. Now I'm an adult. I am responsible for my experience mm -hmm. and how I, I can either be stuck in my story mm -hmm. or I can be connected to the presence and pre pre connected to God. Because when I'm connected to God, I'm connected to who I really am. Mm -hmm. Instead of connected to, I want the approval of this man, or I want to be 
love because by somebody else because then I'll feel better about myself. I, I actually love myself and I felt better. And that, you know, it, it, it's that, that's a process, getting to that process. And that was freedom. And that gift of desperation I had at three and a half years sober of just being just, I was in this dark hole and I didn't know how I was going to get out. And I, I remember I was 30 at the time and I remember thinking, I, I might have to accept that I might have to be celibate the rest of my life because I, I, di I really didn't want to drink, but I, I can't go through 50 more years of this level of pain and survive mm. it. And maybe I just can't, maybe I'm just one of these people who can't have a relationship and that's absurd because we all can. Mm -hmm. um, and it was- So how did you get to that point? Because clearly you are married, you have two children. How did you, so you were three and a half years sober when you were in that black hole. How long did it take you to do the work to get out of that hole? A few months. I mean, it gets, it, it gets better, you know, within six months. So here's my breakthrough. It was about six months later. I remember I had a crush on this guy I used to work with. And after a few weeks, I realized that he didn't feel the same way about me. He just saw me as a friend. And I remember I was walking down the road and I just thought, I realized like, okay, that's not going to happen. He just sees you as a colleague and a friend. And I thought, um, I wonder what's wrong with him. And I just stopped dead in the street and thought, oh, oh my God, I actually believe that because mm. I'd spent my whole life believing there was something wrong with me. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, what's wrong with him? I'd be a great girlfriend. Oh. I'd be just, you know, I just wonder what's up with him that he doesn't see that. And I just, and that's when I had this, this, you know, epiphany. Yeah. You know, recovery is about all that it really is, is a shift in perception. That's really all it is at, at its essence. It's a shift in perception. I just saw everything differently. So what we do is we, you know, something happens and through our filter system that is set up from our childhood, we create this belief. Story or story yeah, around it. Yeah. This guy from, from work doesn't like you because you're not good enough because mm -hmm. that fits with my story and my belief system. Mm -hmm. That whole stuff had just been just gone. I just mm -hmm. didn't have that anymore. I had a belief system that I was good enough and I was going to be loved. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't create that story anymore. And, um, you know, it continued. And then um, a couple of years later, I met my husband. And it's the, really the first healthy functioning adult relationship I've ever had. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of relationships before I met him. And they were such incredible learning opportunities. I really think people are sent to you to prepare you for the person who's coming next. Mm -hmm. And the relationship I had before I met my husband, it's like, kind of the same pattern began to happen. And I was like, hold on a minute, things, things should be different now. And then I had this just massive realization because I was growing, I was able to grow. I saw that his behavior was not personal, that it had nothing to do with me. And I saw for the first time how insecure and frightened he was and that he had to do what he was doing because of how he felt and it was nothing to do with me. And it was the first time that I just, again, it was the same thing. I just didn't take it personally. I just, I kind of felt sad, but I was nowhere near the black hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, then shortly after that, I met my husband and, and um, you know, and I think really my life, the relationship I had with my husband was the cherry on the cake. You know, my life was just so full and great and functioning and healthy. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I used to look for a relationship to like, to create my life. You complete like I had, me. I had the cake, he was the cherry. That is awesome. I said, you know, that, that stereotypical line from Jerry Maguire, you complete me, which drives me crazy. Cause it's like, no, we no, need two complete people to come into yeah, a relationship yeah, if it's going to yeah, be really it, healthy. Exactly. Exactly. I was completed way before he came along. And that's the thing. And to, uh, you, to attract the relationship that you want, you have to become the person that you want to attract. You know, I, I wanted like this healthy, functioning, amazing guy to save me like healthy functioning guys are not going to look at someone who's needy and you know like they're not so when I became that woman he I always say my husband the reason I fell in love with my husband is he was the first man who really saw my worth mm -hmm. he really saw me and yeah and and we've been together 12 years now Oh, it's beautiful. You had stepped into your power. You could feel your worth and you were exuding that, I'm sure. I mean, I can see the way you glow now. I can only imagine as you were doing that work and coming through that and really stepping into your power, I can imagine why he was so attracted to you. It's 
you're amazing. You are a powerhouse and uh, he's a lucky man to have you. And I, and I know you feel the same way about your husband. It's awesome. You, and you know, you just, you've got to do the work. You just got to do the work because yep. here's the thing. That's where the riches are. Mm. That's where, you know, we, we feel like I say to people over and over the fear of doing the work of looking at yourself. Cause that's what it is. You've got to look at yourself. Mm -hmm. It's far worse than the reality of it. Mm -hmm. The reality of looking at yourself is far easier than mm -hmm. running away from it. And here's the thing, when you, when you do the work, there's riches there. I know. So I, I'm kind of like, I'm always up for like, yeah, I'll always do that stuff because I just know there's riches. I know there's just another, you know, what's on the other side of that is really good for me. Interesting. Early on, when you were young, in your 20s, you wanted to work with people. You wanted to be... Um, a therapist, and then look at what's happened in your life, that that is really what you're doing in your life. You're helping people, you're working one-on-one -on -one and in groups with people and, and helping them as a counselor, as a coach, as somebody who is a therapist and, and really helps people to see the truth of their lives, that they are the co-creator, they are the architect of their own misery, but they're also the architect of the beauty as well if they if they choose it. So yeah, they have the, that's the thing. We all have the keys to freedom. We all have the keys to freedom. It's just sometimes we need some outside help to be able to see that. So once again, veronicavalley.com and on Facebook it's Veronica Valley, or is it soberful on Facebook? Uh, Facebook is soberful and there's also soberful.com as well. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for this time, Veronica. I know people are connected with you. You're already a superstar in the, in the recovery world. And I just, you know that I think the world of you. So thank you so much for this time with me. I really appreciate it. And I love talking to you. Thanks, Sarah. To get access to all of the free videos and interviews, visit sobrietystartshere.com.